We quit. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. 6502 powered a whole generation. FPGA GPU for you. And apparently 30 is elderly now. All this and more coming up on today's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Is this our last show, Neil? Are we quit? <laughs> Are we quit? Look, we're recording this on what's the date today, Dave? Today is the the third of April. Oh, did I get you? Did I get you? We don't quit. Of course, we haven't quit. We never quit. The show will go on forever, Dave. It's the first of April, actually. Um, it is. It is. And that that was our that our lame, pathetic April Fool's joke that seems to be de rigueur these days. It seems to be necessary to do a bad one. I know how much you love an April Fool's joke. Dave. I do. And I don't. I came across a good one today. I popped it up on Twitter. Uh, I was reading about something called Cyber Assault 556. This was an Amiga game that was previewed in the One magazine back in April 1990. And uh, it told us that we would get, well, astonishing things from developer Bullfrog. Yeah. No, where have we seen that before? Although this was 1990, so I'm not quite sure how much Bullfrog and Hype were associated. They were. No, they weren't. No, but. You know, Populous was out. But yeah. it was, you know, and, and it was doing well, but it was by no means the big Peter Molyneux hype mm. machine that it became. So this sort of preempted that. Anyway, this game promised us 50 billion planets to explore, uh, over 64 on-screen colors at 25 frames per second in a 3D world of space trading on a humble stock Amiga 500. Sounds mm. great. Screenshots look amazing too. Uh, and it was a two-page spread they dedicated to this April Fool's joke, the scoundrels in the one magazine. And of course, it was all fake. But um, we were so full of hope, weren't we, Dave? I think that's yeah. the thing. When you saw something like that and you didn't perhaps fully understand the machine or its limitations and you'd only just got the machine, having upgraded the huge upgrade from the 8-bit era to something 16-bit, you would have looked at that and thought, wow. Is that, have they it's done not. That? It's it, 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 billions of of systems isn't impossible because I don't know how many systems Frontier had, but why couldn't you just keep the procedural generation going based on a seed? I mean, it's uh, you can keep you can keep doing it, but there was you a could, really really interesting. Sorry, Neil. I was going to say you could certainly do it in a random manner. I don't yes. know that you could do fifty billion in a manner on a sixteen bit machine whereby everything was in the same place for everyone. But yeah, you you could create an infinitely procedurally generated random star well, system. Well, computers can't do random. That's that's one of the things they really struggle to. You try and get them to do random, they do a pattern that's just so complex it may as well be random. So yeah. that's what the whole. That's perhaps why they could do it, but. Let's go on to the reply to the tweet. So mm. there was a reply, reply to the tweet from Art Subi, and it looks to me as if the one completely ripped off um, a Finnish computer hobbyist magazine called, I'm going to pronounce it as Microbitty, and hopefully <laughs> I'm correct. Um, they published. Micro, is it micro? M I double K? Microbitty? Micro no, sing, single K. So oh, Microbitty. Yeah. Double T. Yeah. Um, they published an exclusive. Look at us talking as if we have a, a faintest idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, if we get it right, it's by chance. Uh, published an exclusive preview of a massive space game called Illuminatus. The magazine didn't exactly mention the genre of the game, but described its epic space journeying, trading, combat, and empire building elements. Um, <clears throat> they solemnly described it as not only a game, but a way of life. Uh, and of course, it, it was um, an April Fool's prank, but there, it was parodying the unrealistic expectations placed on games in the press and the unfounded optimism concerning increasing computing power. Moreover, it mocked, I'm reading this, moreover, it mocks the ways in which actual games such as Space Trading and Combat Game Elite, which came out in 1984, mm -hmm. were treated in reviews. Now, I take issue with that. Um, Go on, Dave. What's upset you today? Well, if it's saying that magazines were saying there was more in Elite than there actually was in Elite, it's a subjective thing to say that. We're talking about the imagination gap again. Elite is 
if you really boil it down, it's a fairly simple game. But if you if you let your imagination fill the gap, it's wonderful. And if that's what the if if they were seeing behind the curtain and saying actually it's not that great when you look at what's there, um, it's it's all a facade. I mean, was that a thing we did at the end of the eighties to, towards it, towards mid eighties games? It was a five year old game by this point, so yeah. it was probably you know trendy to, to be it. to be to put a downer on elite. You know, oh, this is an old game. This is for eight bit mm. systems, although it came up for sixteen bit systems. What does the future look like? You know, full of like mm. you say optimism and hope um, and hype for yeah, the future. Hype. So, hype. Rise of the robots, hype. Yeah, but two interesting April Fool's jokes, and maybe the one saw that one on Microbitty and and was inspired the following year. Mm. <laughs> maybe, possible. maybe. What's the what's the what's the chances, Neil? <laughs> Nearing one hundred percent. Maybe. So anyway, I mean, it's all slightly irrelevant because April Fool's was nearly a week ago. If you're listening to this yes. on release, but uh, it just didn't fall right for the show last week. So nice to talk about um, other things that have been going on this week. Thank you to everyone who took a visit to the RMC Retro Dot Store shop and bought a this week in retro mug. Um, do feel free to to tweet us. What's what's our what's our Twitter address? Where are we on socials, Dave? You do that. It's it's um, this week retro, I think. Let me find out. Yeah. So uh, if this you want to show us, if you want to show us you sipping from your this week in retro mug while listening to the show, it's please do share that. At week retro. At week retro. We are week, <laughs> the weakest W-E-A-K, retro show around. Not W E A K. Um, and I've just added to the store as well um, uh, digital downloads so you can get the um, Retro Tea Breaks, the Hoffman and the Colouring Book digitally or as a bundle and I'll shut up now because I don't want to go promoting the shop too It's only a tenner. It's only a tenner. How's your week been? A week's been good. I'm a little bit tired today because I was watching the revision demo party late last night. So I Uh, love to catch that every year. Always slightly tricky because it falls on Easter. And of course, you've got family things. You've got other things going on on Easter normally. So I rushed back last night to catch the Amiga demos, the PC, the 8K demos. There was a DJ set. It's always great to watch. Uh, The Amiga demos were quite strong this year after a week out in Yes, yeah. so that was nice to see. Yeah. And I've been catching up on some of the uh, others, like the old school demo comp that I couldn't watch live. Not fantastic, seen that yet. Fantastic Amstrad CPC one at the oh, end. Oh, I'm always, I'm always oh, hopeful. Yes, and yeah. maybe this is pathetic of me, but I'm always hopeful to see Amstrad CPC and Atari ST demos in there. Um, did you notice a demo from our friend Terrible Fire last night? Oh, He's been I saw telling that me one. about it. He's been telling me about it for a couple of months now, and seemingly he's unable to keep a secret. He's been telling <laughs> everyone else about it apart from his friend Chucky. But yeah, he he made a demo. It from was not um, able to make it, and it was really good. It was an outrun style sprite scaling uh, road flying around with biffa bins by the yeah. side of the road. It had a sinister, the music, the banjo guys, all these music had a, a sinister feel to it. I, I was really impressed by it. Well, it was Castlevania um, cover, wasn't it? Or Dracula Yeah, cover. Yeah, but it, it, so, had, it had that, the whole thing felt quite kind of dark. Hmm. Mm. The music on all the demos actually was really impressive. Yeah. Um, it just gets better and better. The techniques they've got for compressing, you know, complete, fully formed audio tracks into tiny amounts of, of code into a floppy yeah. disk. It's wonderful. In previous years, there was a little bit of almost resentment at all the the A1200 and higher required demos being in there. But now that we're back to a position where there's, there's lots of good A500 demos in the Amiga competition, all of a sudden, no one minds. It's great to be back there. It's nice to see what's possible on that stock machine you had yeah. back in the day, yeah. sort of yeah. as the default. And then yeah. it's also nice to see a few accelerated, yeah. you know, what can this be pushed to, to the max? But it's but good I, we're getting I, both I now, like rather than in, in, in the previous years, we, we tended to see less of the A500 stuff. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's revision. Uh, it's still going on today. Um, it won't be on Saturday, but you'll find it all over YouTube. You'll find it on Twitch. Just look up Revision Demo Party 2024 and you'll be able to watch back. Uh, and the winners haven't been announced yet, so we'll catch that later today. Yeah, the voting is the voting hasn't yet closed at the time we're recording. Um, revision, oh, what's the website? 2024.revision-party.net. That's where to go. I will make it there one day. One day. 
Good. Well, um, that's that's been the week. I'm going to sip some more coffee to wake myself up. And should we get into the first story? Yeah. So, Neil, did you know that one CPU powered a whole generation of computers, in fact, most 8 bits? Oh, yes, the Z80. Well, that's what I thought. But no, it's the 6502. Now, Lord Borak has submitted a video from 8-Bit Guy, which talks about that particular CPU. He's managed to take what's possibly a bit of a dry topic and make it quite accessible um, without just going on about the games. And I think it can only be described as his love letter to the MOS 6502. Mm, he is a very competent coder, as we've seen from the games that he's written yeah. himself. So he is well positioned to talk about yeah. this, isn't he? he? He really does love the 6502. That, that's what he's all about. Now, I didn't realize how ubiquitous it was. So the 6502 or variant was used in the Atari 2600, the C64, in pacemakers, in satellites, in lots of stuff. And in fact, two of the original three home micros, that's the Apple II and the Commodore PET used it, the TRS-80 used the Z80. Um, it's clear he's a big fan of it and he presents the video in a way that makes it look good, but no wonder there's miles of nostalgia with that little chip. Um, its mainstream life did last a while. Uh, the Super Nintendo, for example, had one running around four times the speed of the C64. But of course, the Super Nintendo had some really beefy co-processors in its chipset for graphics. And when you saw the SNES doing amazing stuff, you were really seeing those co-processors doing it for it. So unlike older micros, the CPU by that point was kind of the ringmaster of the circus rather than a one-man band like it was in the uh, well more like a one-man band because it wasn't it wasn't quite exclusive like that way in most systems and just for the sake of being correct i should say that there's lots of variants of the 6502 but i'm not going to talk about the differences because fundamentally they're the same technology now there's lots more that he says in the video and i won't cover it all here but what made me think about it is just how prolific the 6502 is. I actually thought the Z80 was in more things than the 6502, and maybe the Z80 had a longer life than it. Um, but there's certainly there's still loads of 6502 around. But of course, the elephant in the room is the 8086 of the processors of the time. It went on to conquer things with its iterations, the 8286, the 386, 486, and beyond. So, Neil, do you love your 6502? <laughs> um I do love the 6502, and I'm just looking here as you're talking about the availability of it. And I, I couldn't tell you if this is a drop-in replacement for, say, a C64 machine or not, but you can buy a variant of some sort of a brand new still, still manufactured 6502 chip from WDC, Western Design Center. That's over on Mouser uh, Electronics. Um, so it, it still exists in, in a form. <laughs> There's, there's a few variants of it. I said I wouldn't talk about them, but I'll talk about them. Uh, there's a few variants of it. Mostly it's just a pinout difference, although some have had it. The VIC-20, for example, didn't have a hold uh, call to the CPU, but later iterations of it did have that hold call, so you could stop it and use DMA for graphics, for example. Yeah, you talked about the – well, we talked about a few things, the Z80 or the Z80 to our American friends. Z. Uh, the Z80. Um, hey. The uh, AT86 you mentioned. Um, of course, you didn't get the AT86 without the AT85 or the AT80 or the AT08. You know, there's a lineage in all of these chips that goes back to the early 70s. Uh, in the case of the AT86, it tried to keep that basic instruction set compatibility, although a lot changed from chip to chip. And I think the beauty of the 6502 is, yes, there were iterations later, it changed. But for a long period, it was the same chip that stuck around and it powered so many things without the, the R&D of Intel bringing a new one out every year. The 6502 just diligently did what it did and worked. Um, it seemed to be very reliable. Um, so, uh, you know, it powered a lot of... A lot of machines that for a lot of people were our first experience of machines. Uh, for me, the BBC Micro was probably the first I tried with a 6502 in, um, then a C64, and a friend who had an Electron. Effectively, I cut down BBC Micro. So um, similar experience. But to be honest, I didn't sit down at any of these and go, wow, it's a 6502 machine. Because you wouldn't know. You wouldn't yeah. know. It was just another 8-bit Micro in a very, very competitive 
particularly in the UK, very competitive um, 8-bit microcomputer market. And you just wanted to see what a system could do when you sat down. You know, I wasn't a programmer, so I couldn't get into the nitty gritty with you about what CPU was best per instruction cycle and all of that stuff. But I could sit down at a C64 and I could say, that's that's a damn good system. Yes, it's complemented with lots of custom chips, but it's underpinned by the 6502. Uh, and the C64... Probably top of the list, probably the first one I think of when I think about this CPU, Dave. Yeah, I should say that the 6502 is seemingly, it's, it's more it's efficient, the word. For one megahertz on a 6502, you need about four on a Z80 to do the same thing. Yeah, because the Z80 was around seven, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's standard. Um, no, about four, three and a half on the spectrum, four on the Armstrong, I think. Was it? What am I thinking about? Am I thinking about the Spectrum Next or something? I'm thinking about Maybe some thinking kind of accelerated 68K, 68,000. Oh, I am, yes. Eight, yeah, eight on an ST and seven on, a, on an Amiga. That's where I've got that from, yes. Yeah, I mean, seven's all you need, really. You know, the, the extra <laughs> one is just sort of wasted on the ST, wasn't it? Yeah, it that's... wasted on the Mac. The Mac, the Mac had an eight megahertz one that affected the <laughs> run at six. There you go. Anyway, well spotted. That's where I got that from. You've <laughs> saved me a lot of comment rage going on. <laughs> I think you'll find. I think you'll find. My favorite, um, um, I guess, spin off of the 6502 would be the Hudson Soft one, the, uh, the HUC 6280, which is the CPU at the heart of the PC engine. So that was a 6502 that could run uh, at two speeds, the top speed being just over seven megahertz. So it's like a. And that, that's why I mentioned this, the relative speed between them, because if you think of a Z80 running at. I mean, at 50 megahertz, that would be incredible for the time. And that extra power in the PC engine really does does show in the system. You know, it keep it's a it's a it's a 6502 that keeps pace with the likes of the Super Nintendo and the Sega Mega Drive offerings of the 16-bit era. Arguably, the the PC engine's a bit of a funny one. It's you know an 8-bit CPU complemented by 16-bit, I think, custom chips, graphics chip, sound chip, things like that. It, it's it's sort of a hybrid somewhere between the two. Uh, but again, at the, at the heart of it, the 6502 in that form, and it, it's a real powerhouse. Um, I do get, I get it, I get nostalgia for CPUs, um, primarily because you and I grew up in an era of code listings, and we grew up being told that this game is better than that game, or even this um, package this office package is better than that package because it's written in assembly code. Or this this real roaster simulation tycoon <laughs> thing is better. Yes. Yeah, this roller coaster thing. It's written in assembly. Yeah. Um and that was that was the most godlike of programmers. You know, if you cut them they would bleed machine code. And many of us promised ourselves one day, <laughs> one day we will get around to learning it properly. We will get good at this. In my case, it would be the Z80 because of the Amstrad yes. CPC. Did you? No. Did you? It's no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I, still, I still have that kind of aspirational attachment to the CPU to one day get good at it. It will likely mm. happen in a retirement home. It will be the Sudoku of my time to yeah. keep my brain working. And um, I'm sure even more people feel like that about the 6502 because of the popularity of the C64, yeah. the Beeb, the Electron. Whatever was your first machine, I'm sure there's lots of people out there who are thinking the same. So yeah. I'll see you in the nursing home. Yeah, and it's because it's because it's possible. It's it's feasible with it to try and then do it the six to sixty eight k. I guess is as well. But once you start to go beyond that, the, the complexity kind of multiplies so the, these these little 6502s the z80s the 8080 it's possible to do it on those or it's aspirationally positive possible to do it that's why i bought the Aegon because i want to do it with that there's the Aegon's oh yeah a z80 and that um but go and watch the video it's uh, not just informative but it's interesting and he finishes off by talking to one of the designers bill mensch and he asked him why it didn't last long beyond the 16-bit era because well you still you still get 6502s now they're not as 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 popular as common as the z80 for example and he says in the 16-bit era he was recommending arm so he clearly knows his onions we are sponsored this week thank you very much by pcb way uh, makers of all sorts of fabricated things like pcbs cnc milling uh, 3d printing all sorts of stuff 
Yeah, although I'm not sure how much it would uh, it would cost to 3D print our latest project, the full size computer space over on the Arcade Archive channel. Uh, worth putting a quote in though, we could find out. I might do that once I've got the STL off of Richard. Uh, but something PCBWay.com have produced for me is the recreated Commodore PC20 system board PCB, which I'm delighted to say is now built tested and working um, thanks to the help of Chrissy and the board folk. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that back. Uh, I ordered about 10 of them from PCB way a while back. They came in perfect condition, gleaming. Um, so once I've got it back and I'm satisfied with it, I'm going to order a whole nother batch from PCB way um, and make them available to others who need to restore their Commodore PC twenties. So that's just one example of the, the kind of service that PCBWay.com offer. Thank you very much, PCB.com. We love a good hardware story here, Dave, especially when it's something to revive and rejuvenate classic systems. And we always get excited about the flexibility of new hardware that utilizes things like the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, or FPGA solutions because of the possibilities that they introduce. You're not just buying the thing to do the job. You're buying a thing that can be flashed, modified and upgraded at the software uh, level to do things even better. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, we've seen it with sound cards, and you and I have mused about how that approach could be taken with video cards and other peripherals, and how cool it would be if you could simply change your sound card and your video card on the fly on a 486 PC. I think that's, that's the dream, isn't it, to be using yeah. real vintage hardware with those mod cons that are completely seamless, don't dump you back to a, a modern desktop don't break the immersion but maybe with a, a driver maybe with a line in auto exec maybe with a, a, a tsr program you can quickly switch what it's doing yeah, yeah. love so, that idea so that exists already for things like the the pico gus yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Pico Gus, the Pigus, um, Pico Gus already has those commands. The um, where you can you can tell it to be something else, like you would do on the auto exec. So that that's that's cool. Yeah, you can put lipstick on a Pigus and it will behave differently. Oh, it's not called Pigus anymore, is it? No, it's, it's called Pigus, Pigus to me. You know, <laughs> for, for, for listeners, the project was originally called the Pi Gravis Ultra System to the Pigus. Pigus. <sighs> <laughs> which is where the snort came from, which is why the, the logo that Ian's apparently calling Dave now is a pig uh, <laughs> after me. Um, but it's now the you've people that You've made it, Dave. You are. <laughs> Got your own pig logo. This story this week was submitted by Dr. Local, and through it, we're kind of a step closer to that reality of what we've been talking about, because this is about the Fury GPU, nothing to do with DJ Chris Fury. Uh, the Fury GPU is uh, an FPGA-based video card. Now, the article reads as follows. Created by software engineer Dylan Barry, Fury GPU is the combination of four years of work that started as a simple project. Barry was interested in the idea of making a homemade GPU as his next hobby. I'd spend a few months making a spinning cube or something, and I'd be done with it, he thought. However, fast forward several years, and the scope of the project expanded beyond graphics demos and into the realm of actual 3D accelerated games running on his homemade graphics card. The Fury GPU uses a custom PCB equipped with a cryo system on module that features a xilinx zinc ultra scale plus fpga chip it's got a couple of video outputs and this is on a pci express 2 uh, by 4 connection so this isn't something we can drop into our 486s at this stage you know it is it is a pcie card but uh, it does take us a step closer. The power of it is akin, they say, to a mid-90s card. I haven't tried this myself, but I've gone to the write-up about mid-90s, and they say that's demonstrated running Quake at 720p at 60 frames per second. Now, you'd be very, very happy with that in the mid-90s. I'd say... Delighted. I don't know. if you Would you find 720p Quake in 1995 at 60 frames per second? No. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come on to that, but I, 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 I okay. have my doubts about that. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, that means it's a GL version of Quake um, So to use utilize the GPU. Uh, back then, I was pushing the limits of my DX4100 and a slightly shrunk window in Quake to try and get a decent frame rate. Did play it all the way through, but I was happy with that software rendering. Uh, and then GL Quake came along later as uh, GPUs took off, or 3D accelerated GPUs. 
Um, it also works happily, this thing, just in Windows as, a, as your regular 2D card rendering the desktop and all of that. So it's a wonderful achievement for uh, Dylan as a hobbyist. Um, the icing on top, really, though, is that he's releasing it as open source. So there is now an opportunity for those of us who are a bit more backwards to, to run with it, put it on a PCI form factor, um, see what can be done. I, I don't know about ISA. It depends what you're doing with it, but I'm not sure that there's enough bandwidth to really to push no. OpenGL or, or as, you know, you're not going to really be pushing that on a 386 or a, no. you know, no, an early 486. No. Um, but perhaps this could be a PCI homebrew voodoo card. Um Perhaps it could bring us 3DFX games without the price tag of those very collectible and therefore expensive Voodoo cards. Uh, it's open source, so anything can be done with it if there's enough uh, enough interest there. So, Dave, would you slide this into your old slot? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, and reading through the spec and the speed it operates, uh, I had it down as something along the lines of a, a Reva, Reva 2 kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but the register says mid-90s. I'm thinking late 90s. I'm, I'm thinking to get Quake at 720 FP, uh, frames per second, you'd be looking at something from the late 90s rather than something from 1996. So uh, I'm not quite sure if they made a, a little bit of a, a mistake there. It sounds more powerful to me. I'm sure there will be someone out there who had you know, money to throw at the perfect rig in 1995 oh, yeah. or 1996 and, and somehow achieved that. But you, you're in the realms of you know hardcore hobbyists rather than casual gamer. And when we're putting together retro PCs, we are often looking for that. We're looking for better than the period hardware setup. We're not looking to play mm -hmm. Quake at 15 frames a second on the ropey Cynic CPU we had at the time and we were promised was just as good as a Pentium. <laughs> and it's not. Um, we're looking for our dream PC to absolutely smash it at 60 frames per second and 720 FPS, something that's credibly still feels like it's from back then, but with all the sharp edges taken off and that's where these type of projects come in and this this is why they're good generally you can find plenty of spares for pcs going right back to 286 times there's loads of it kicking about and i think it's harder to justify going beyond 286 to the 8086 there's not really so much that's um compelling in the pc games uh, arena to play um you're better off maybe in the apple too um, but what you find is you can easily find office pc stuff and the equipment that went in them and you can easily find low-end cheap consumer upgrades what's difficult to find is the expensive stuff that was only in home systems or in high-end rare workstations so the top tier CPUs from a generation, the very fastest of the, the list of CPUs for a particular socket. Yeah, the mon uh, money is no object CPU yeah. that very few people actually bought. Yeah. yeah. And Gravis ultrasounds and the better creative sound blaster cards. And of course, the top end graphics cards. And that's not helped by seemingly worse BGA problems. So that's ball grid array. That's the way that they put these, they mounted these graphics CPUs onto the cards where BGA problems, they didn't have it quite right, the process, and they eventually failed. And seemingly, the more powerful the GPU is, the more likely it is to, to have failed um, this way. So high-end cards are hard to come by. Um, now, that, that does sometimes mean that you go for a lower end of card from the next generation. Um, and that sometimes is just as good. But this might be what... Th th this might be ideal. This might be the way to get a very high-end, um, real, in, in quote marks, graphics card from the era um, in the machine without having the unreliability, without having a card that you're worried is going to die or you feel is inevitably is going to die one day. And it does have applications for perhaps playing retro games on a modern machine. So, for example, if you put FreeDOS on a machine with a PCI Express port, um, you're in your MS DOS environment. You've got a very, very yeah. capable but compatible graphics card with OpenGL. Does it support OpenGL or is it using its own API in Quake? It uses its own API. It uses its own uh, API. But he says it's relatively easy to translate them, which yeah. I'll take his word for that. <laughs> um, but PCI is good. I think it's good. I think it's, it's maybe better than having PCI or it's maybe not a problem because for the, the reasons you just mentioned, what we want to do is take 
the cheapest, most available old PCs that we can get and have them running as wonderful, capable DOS machines. Last week in um, briefs, we talked about a Phil's Computer Lab project on the Sound Blaster emulator that I've forgotten the name of. Um, and that combined with a PCIe Pentium 4 or Core 2 Duo plus this PCIe card could see you having something that was natively compatible with all this stuff. Mm. And um, plus free and, DOS. Yeah, it could yeah, be really nice. Yeah, and if, and yeah. if we can find a DOS like project uh, like Exodos that actually runs in DOS, wouldn't that be yeah. nice? Yeah. Yeah, that would as, be as that would be as ideal. Exodus is, but it, it, again, it just removes that layer again of Windows and and yeah. keeps you immersed in the environment. That be yeah, I, I, it's a theme we keep bring, bringing up, or certainly I do on this. That I want DOS games to be as accessible as possible because they're such such an important brand new. All these all these these doors opened and all these fantastic games came out, and in some ways they're very difficult to play. Yeah, yeah. And it just eases accessibility to these games for people that want to dip in and say, well, why do people talk about that game? I wasn't around then. Um, and then they get to a point of, hang on a minute, what's uh, what's up a memory? Why am I getting these errors? How do I how do I, how do I run this game? You want to make it accessible and affordable. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. Is it a lot for a lot of DOS games, are they maybe the first point in their genre where the game really does last and it it, it, it uh, has stood the test of time and it's playable now without nostalgia mm. is that is that why i don't know mm. well, that's a whole other can of yeah. worms let's not open that right now um it takes a step closer to closer to as you say choosing our ideal combo is it an or 64 and a voodoo 3 would you be happy with a sound blaster 16 and a nice solid 2d video card nice svga card or something um, I, I remember how wowed I was when I first fired up my first IBM PC compatible that I had and I played TFX and I played Day of the Tentacle and it was in 256 colors and it was just astonishing. Windows 3.1 was just a very weird feeling thing when I'd come from Workbench on my Amiga, but boy, the DOS games blew away any Amiga games mm. that I'd been playing at the time. Um, uh, Maybe we're just chasing that feeling, Dave. Is that is that what we're doing? We're chasing that moment again. Oh, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> There's don't, another can of worms don't for you. Do that. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't take it all away from us. But yes, we are. The thing with the thing with with retro is we can never be 15 years old again. That's it. That's the problem. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, another solution, of course, is the Mister FPGA project, and a new, a nice, more recent way to explore DOS games is the Zero Megahertz project at zero mhz dot net or z dot net. Uh, and what that does is it puts a list of DOS games in your Mister menu in the main menu, about one hundred and seventy at the moment. Uh, so you just choose a game. And it and it drops you into an FPGA emulate, emulated MS DOS uh, environment with the sound card in FPGA with the video card in FPGA. Nice option, and people are now combining that with um, NFC tap things. So you, you've got sort of a you've got a stack of your Pokemon cards, but they're not Pokemon; they're actually game boxes, and you can tap them and and one of those 170 games and expanding. I'm sure that list will grow ever ever more so if you've got just a like mr. Shop. fpga just like the shop so if you've got a, a mr fpga that's the way to do it dave I, I like that we're now in an era where we're seeing uh, curation of retro libraries because for the past 20 odd years of retro what we've found or what we used to get more of was these great big lists with 14 different versions of the same game. You don't know which one to have. All sorts of games that 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 I, I, some people will argue for the preservation of them, but they're rotten games. They were unfinished. They didn't put much effort into it, and they, they clutter up the lists of the good games. So I, I like that we're seeing curation in these things. Uh, to make it to make it easier to enjoy it, so I, I, I like that we're in that era of retro and projects like um, Zero Megahertz and others like it uh, are, are great in my view. Yep, and it's not the first time someone's hacked together a DIY video cards. There are other projects such as that by Ben Eater, which is linked in the same register article. The link is in the show what notes. Great name. 
Benita, go and have a read. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe they'll combine forces at some point and you can have the, the Fury Eater GPU. Talking about Fury, play DJ Chris Fury's um, Jingle for us. We are now at that point of the show where we are deep in Dave's briefs. Uh, all of the stories that are not fit for a full uh, chat, or we just haven't picked out for a full chat because we perhaps don't know enough about it <laughs> to shape a whole story about it. But or there's only an hour. <laughs> or there's only an hour. So we'll start by welcoming uh, new patrons. So if you'd like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash this week in retro as new patron Richard. Do we? We don't read their surnames out, do we? No, we, we keep that secret. It's, it's on the end scroll, but we, yeah. we keep that secret. Yeah, we've well, nearly said it. Your, uh, your, yeah, your, your, your details will be kept confidential with us. Don't worry, no data leaks here. But Richard, thank you so much for becoming an official twirler, um, Dave. A wee reminder that um, uh, we'll leave it open. The the question and answer session that Neil and I are going to do for oh, patrons. Yeah. It's still open. Get your questions in before we close it off. Thank you for quite a lot of submissions. Good I don't questions. think we'll, there's, there's more than we we're expecting, so it's going to take us a while to do to do that. Not quite sure when we're going to book the time in to do it, but we'll get to it. Thank you, patrons. Um, and I seem to have inspired people to talk about virtual pinball. Um, Sybil66 has submitted an image of his budget one. It's a 42-inch TV repurposed with an X arcade joystick. So the X arcade joystick is a huge, big dual stick thing with pinball buttons on the side. Uh, and he's got another monitor up top. Uh, it looks pretty good, actually. I think it's, it's the start of a project which you could add solenoids, etc., to give it the sound and feel of being real. But it shows that image there, which um, I'm sure Duncan will put up on the screen for listeners to miss, uh, will show how a virtual pinball table starts off and uh, where it, you can understand from there where it ends up. And if you're unsure about doing a project like Virtual Pinball, it's a great way to just set it up and get a feel for it and say to yourself, is this for me? Is this going to go to the level that I want it to go to, or should I stop here and repurpose this XRK joystick, which is a good stick for something else, or this TV for something else? The more you talk about it, the more I'm tempted to try it out. What about a cave video on it? Do you have do you have wood cutting facilities at the? Cave? We do. Um, I, I I did plan on doing one about ten years ago because I made my mini gauntlet cabinet yeah. and I was going to complement it with a mini virtual pinball cabinet. Uh, virtual pinball was a thing then it wasn't you know yeah. anywhere near as advanced as it is no. now um so i could come back to that and i could have my mini gauntlet that i've made and some kind of mini pinball yeah. because i would want it personally i would want it to be something i can pick up and put where i need it mm. you know portable accessible because i don't really <laughs> stupid thing to say i don't have the space dave um, <laughs> for, for a gigantic pinball machine mm. it's not about the space i like to have the flexibility to move displays mm. and you know I, um, you know how many I, stairs there are to get into the cave. Yeah. I've been looking into it, and uh, it's uh, the, the technology is amazing now. There's all sorts of uh, solenoids and little speakers and so on and kickers and shakers to try and get – it's not just about – a fast moving image in front of you to convince it it's also about the the sound cues you get and the feelings and the feedback you get from the table so there's all sorts of things going on there it's really fascinating i'm down that rabbit hole now looking into it um i've been speaking to people on a, on a pinball forum there's possibly someone talking about selling me one which are, is not a stage I, I wanted to be at yet uh but it's absolutely fascinating and in fact um Dr. Local submitted the Tech Moan video that we talked about last week. Uh, he submitted it before we broadcast last week, so he, he wasn't aware we mentioned it. But yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, the technology, etc. Chris Walsh uh, commented last week, stop ronin in people, have mercy. Um, I'm sorry about Chris, that, Chris, but, um, you know, don't fight it, fight it, fight it, as Ronin would say. Um, Randall Hater says, great show as always. Where does the term Ronin come from? <laughs> or maybe Ronin. Is this show style English or more common? And I said, I'll ask Neil to explain it to you. So, Neil, um, you have excluded our audience who don't 
who aren't aware of the UK pop charts around 25 years ago. Please explain yourself to them. I, I, I'm not sure I am going to explain, Dave, because, you know, life is a roller coaster. Um, Ronan Keating. Sometimes you've just got to ride it. Ronan Keating was, the, I think, the lead singer, or were they all lead singers? I don't know. The, the, lead, the lead singer of, of a group of, of boy band singers. The worst dancer. Called- the worst dance. That's <laughs> how it works. <laughs> Instead of getting put in goals because you're rotten at football, you get told, no, you stand at the front. You start um, hold this microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Ronan Keating was the the, the, the the main singer of the band Boyzone. Uh, so there was an annoying song that was overplayed in the radio that, that seemingly Neil and his wife <laughs> Lily liked to annoy each other by reminding themselves on, and they have called it doing a roaring, roaring each other. So there you go. Sorry if you felt excluded. The topic of fiberglass came up, didn't it, Dave? Yeah, so um, there's a comment in there uh, from uh, ATM 9404, and he says, Dave says computer space machines are rarer and I assume more fragile because they were made uh, of fiberglass. That's not apparently the case. Um, He says they're more likely to survive because uh, they're not made of wood, which rots. Fiberglass is more durable in terms of um in terms of water resistance and he talks about how so many um wooden cabinets have all rotted because of the uh, because of water or because of being in humid climates and certainly we've seen that neil you're going to see it aren't you uh, uh, well computer space the, originally the cabinets were famously made by um hot tub manufacturers so <laughs> designed to hold water uh, yeah. as opposed to the, the you know the, the wooden cabinets that as soon as uh, a little bit of wo- uh, water gets into the bottom it seeps up it sucks it all the way up the wood the wood expands it can be it can be fixed but some are beyond saving fiberglass you know that's not going to happen and if there's damage to it the way fiberglass is you can you can sort of relayer it can't you and repair it so it is a durable thing yeah, in fact, there's an arcade archive video where they do a raid, and you see the the Star Wars Star Wars machine and the cabinet just kind of folds down. It's such a, a a horrible sight to see something like that just falling away because of the water damage. And ATM nine four four zero four says the reason why they're they're more rare is because the game wasn't that much of a commercial success. No, it wasn't. It took yeah, Pong. I, the next game was the yeah. was the big the first big commercial success. Computer space is better than Pong. <laughs> but the world wasn't ready for it. And it there's, when, when we listen back to Ted Dabney podcast episodes where they interview all the old Atari people, uh, and these are Atari people from the 70s and early 80s mostly, they, they often talk about how video games were seen to be a fad. It was going to be a, a flash in the pan and then they were going to be gone. Of course they're not. Yeah, that's the Ted Dabney Experience podcast. Well worth a listen. Retro spotters, have you spotted any retro in the mainstream this week? I want to know. I want to make this part of the the show, Dave. You've got your briefs. I want. I want retro spotting. Sybil sixty six on the subreddit. He's a better name. He's a better name. Retro (laughs) spotting is not good enough. Well, Sybil sixty six. Neil's noticers has suggested that we call this practice retronizing. Retronizing. Neil's retronizing. Maybe. We'll come up with a name. That means we need a jingle. <laughs> I'm going to go into competition with you, Dave. Dave's briefs <laughs> and my as-yet-to-be-named retro spotting in the mainstream. Of course, all of the spots this week have been about the new Ghostbusters film. Um, someone mentioned a, a Commodore pet. I think I saw a screenshot of a BBC Micro with an IBM monitor on top of it. Uh, and then there was an IBM, I think, an XT machine spotted. So that's your spots for this week. Uh, I'll work on the format. We'll, we'll make that happen. Feel free to send your titles, suggestions, and jingles in. <laughs> the Guardian has run an article about more people not wanting to give up on physical media, especially DVDs, thanks to I Am Amiga for letting us know. Um People just generally unhappy with the way things are and wanting DVDs for a bit of, is it certainty? Uh, something you can hold in your hand and know what it is. We've talked about that a lot. So um, it's uh, encouraging to see more people going back to physical media. Uh, well, another possibility for a slot on the show, does it run Doom? Well, Skit has submitted a, a story in which Doom is seen running on a router. 
yeah, it's been done to death, hasn't it? Does it does it run Doom? But uh, there you go. It's on a router. We had a, a toothbrush recently. Um, that's that's the latest one there. I think Reese might be working on something as well. But does, I can't see anything. It's a secret. Does Doom run on Reese? Yeah, Doom runs on Reese. Um, reviews of the 400 Mini are coming out. The Guardian seems to like it. Coverage seems to be universally positive. And I remember this podcast used to have the fight the used to have to fight the corner of the minis against people who didn't like that they existed. It looks as if that battle has been won. People now quite happy to accept that. Okay, it's not for me, but for lots of other people, it's an ideal little toy. Um, but that is apart from the joystick. Um, senior buy or senior buy. Is it senior buy? Or is it senior buy? Yeah, like senior. Senior. Senior hey, buy. It's senior yeah. buy. Let's not go down the road of doing, <laughs> doing accents, Neil. There's nothing wrong with that accent. Let's just know that it's been. It's, there's a problem with the joystick. It's falsely reporting directions when another is pressed. And supposedly Metal Jesus Rocks reported that to the company and they said it's a feature. And I wonder I wonder if it's to do with a, a gating issue. I'm holding up now for for this a, a, a sand no, 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 no. Well, the, sandman part. The problem as I've read it is that you've got the traditional looking joystick and then at the base of the joystick there's a ring which looks like it doesn't do anything because the original one didn't do anything, mm-hmm. but it's actually four buttons to, to navigate the menus and one right. of them's to pause, I think. So it's very easy to accidentally knock that and pause the game while you're playing the game. There may be two different issues, but that's the one issue I've read about. Right. So this this issue is um, defective units. When a joystick is pushed to full stroke in some direction, an adjacent jet direction will falsely register. Oh, that's another problem too. Yeah. Then. yeah. So, so that that if it is that, then it, it, it's possibly a gating issue. So this I'm holding up the camera there. A, a gate from a, a genuine Sanwa parts joystick, and all it does is it stops the joystick going in a diagonal direction. So you have to go up or left, and you can't go both ways because lots of old arcade machines were four way, and if you if you if you did it in two directions, you did it diagonal, you ended up getting either one or the other, but not the one you expected. Sometimes, yeah, playing Pac Man on an eight way stick, yeah. for example, is very yeah. frustrating. Yeah. yeah, so I, I wonder if it's that. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing, and it also reminds me that there's something apparently in Mister now to allow you to use an eight-way stick on four-way games and not have that problem. I don't know what Voodoo it uses to do that, though. Hmm. 8-Bit Doe have released a very nice-looking C64-style mechanical keyboard, much like the Famicom one that they did recently. Uh, No doubt it's the same keyboard, but with lovely C64 styling, and I believe it comes with a little joystick or a couple of joysticks with it, doesn't it, as well? A little peripheral that comes with it. Yeah. I like the. I bought the Famicom one. I like the colours of it. It's uh, nice. It's a nice yeah. presentation. They yeah. make solid nice products. Yeah. It is missing a numeric keypad, but then you might argue so too did the C sixty four. So it's fine. Yeah. You can always get a little USB add on numeric keypad if you want. I am still very much using my Amiga themed Amiga branded Simulant mechanical keyboard, which does have the numeric keypad. Um, I've got it right in front of me here for those on video. Cherry uh, MX Brown. Lovely keyboard. But there are options out there. Uh, I guess the the hobby is being noticed more and more and more by companies like this, by things like the Mini, by things like 8 Bit yeah. with their products. Yeah. Uh, it's a great time to be in the hobby. Um, Christ, if why don't you let us know that a 30-year-old menu in Windows was only meant to be temporary and it's still there. However, it's not quite as um, as bad as that sounds. It's the format menu, and it was made in a day, so formatting discs or USB sticks now. Uh, but it looks like they did it so well that it was left in place. And why? Well, it's an interesting story. The guy who did it, uh, there's a tweet to him explaining it, and he said he did it just in a morning. It was about taking code from the uh, 9X version of Windows to put into NT, or the other way around, I can't remember, they needed a menu, so he very quickly knocked up that format disk menu that we all know. But he also talks about something that he set as a, as a limit for the FAT file system when doing it that stuck around. So the whole 32 gigabyte FAT file system limit was a, a decision made <laughs> on a whim, part of a decision made on a whim in that menu that has stuck around. That's how he explains it. I'm sure there's a much more technical explanation than that, but... 
yeah, very interesting. Are those our briefs for the week? Yeah, there's loads more. There's loads more on the subreddit. Go and have a browse if you want to read some stuff, if you want to kill some time when you're stuck on the toilet or if you're trying to waste some time at work or on the train. Have a look there. Submit stories to us. If there's something you want us to talk about, then submit it there. Or go and click the little up and down arrows to let us know what you'd like to talk about next week. Thank you very much to everyone who submits stuff there. Thank you. Would you say that being 30 year old makes you an elder, Neil? Um, uh, that's funny. When you turn 30, you might start to feel a bit old. But now when you look back, no, spring chicken. No, so no. spring chicken. No, no. I'm looking down the barrel of 50 and I assure <laughs> you I'd love to be 30. Bethesda's long running series, though, has hit 30. And thanks to Christ of Why Not You for letting us know. Bethesda, 30 years ago, released Elder Scrolls Arena on the 25th of March, 1994. And since then, in the main line of games in the Elder Scrolls, they released Daggerfall in 1996, Morrowind in 2002, Oblivion in 2006, Skyrim in 2011, Skyrim in 2016, Skyrim in 2017 <laughs> and finally Skyrim in 2021 and while I'm kind of joking I'm also telling the truth they did Skyrim then the, the special edition then VR and then the anniversary edition and I'll defend them here it's a great yeah, game why so not? Keep I was say, it. Yeah. and why not yeah. yeah that of course isn't all there's been other games um, there's been numerous expansions and DLCs including the horse armor but also some good ones there's been mobile games, which I don't care about. And, of course, not forgetting Elder Scrolls Online. And, of course, the upcoming Elder Scrolls Six, which was announced in 2016 with no release date yet, although it's believed and expected to be on schedule for the new Xbox release in 2028. For as much as I think of these as PC RPGs, the success of them was driven very heavily by Xbox players so it's time to make duncan get the counter out neil so say it out loud what game's legacy was the elder scrolls following wizardry thank you <laughs> just like my t-shirt says <laughs> and funnily enough i mentioned a couple of weeks ago there was a, a kind of a changing of the guard in the 90s the the big companies origin fell away and new companies like bethesda came forward and bethesda came forward with the elder scrolls games and then the fallout series when they took over the franchise and they brought us fantastic world simulation rp games rpg games you get lost in an ever increasing depth in the world that they create and sadly get a more console friendly casual experience as the series went on but that's not to say the games are bad because the games are fantastic despite of this. They've moved forward in, in lots of other ways. So, Neil, have you played them? And what's the most immersive world you've been in? So I've just been reading the reviews for uh, Elder Scrolls, Scrolls Arena on Steam. And my favorite review on here is, I can't get past the first dungeon. 10 out of 10. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> Imagine uh, if they couldn't get it to load in conventional memory. Uh, they'll give it 11. Yeah, uh, And another one says, honestly, would love to play it, but my Zuma brain can't handle this. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a few comments about difficult and unexplained controls. It's just the age of it. It's just the age of it. Yes, in the modern context, it might be difficult to get to grips with it. Uh, but I'm sure if you persevere, there's plenty of depth to be had out of uh, a 1994 game, Elder Scrolls Arena, particularly if you're a fan of the later games. I got on board with that particular series with Morrowind. So at the time, a flatmate, uh, he was playing it, and I just passed his room, saw it over his shoulder and thought, hello, what have we got here? This looks interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I got him to show me what it was all about. Uh, so that wasn't Arena, that was Morrowind. And yeah, um, yeah I, I, I was interested, but I didn't really get into it at that point uh, because I was already obsessed with another game that starts with the letter U. Uh, in, in terms of um, immersive worlds, you've been talking about getting immersed in these worlds, haven't you? Um that's really hard because it's not in, in, immersion is not entirely down to technical achievement. You, you can get very immersed in a text adventure. Of course, the imagination gap comes into play uh, just as much as you can get immersed in a living, breathing sandbox RPG world. That being said, some of the games that I've got lost in are 
Um, they're basically anything with an element of free roaming and the feeling of mystery or secrets to uncover that keep you coming back for more, Dave. Yeah, the, I love environmental storytelling is apparently what the, the phrase is for it. Oh, I love it? the idea of when you're, when you're in these games, like Skyrim, for example, or Morrowind or Oblivion, and you're solving a quest in there of there being more beneath the surface if you happen to look. Yeah. Of yeah. little stories that, 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 that it's not important or essential at all for you to know. But if you look beneath the surface, there's all sorts of other little things going on there. And even that it, kind it, of stuff in the game is amazing. Even more so stories that don't exist, but you just convince yourself that they do yes. exist. Or little hints at them. Well, even, it happens even in a like, lot of games, from, yeah, from RPGs Bio, Bio to, yeah. uh, to, to flight sims, where you used to get manuals yeah. with identification charts of planes that never actually existed in the in the game, but, but you learned their silhouettes just in case they ever well, popped up. The first one that I remember, talking back to Elite, the first one that I remember was space dredgers and generation ships which were talked about in the elite manual hmm. and you always wondered are they in the game have i just not found them yeah do i need to search deeper do i need to go yeah. further into the universe yeah. to find them and no doubt a catalyst for that also was the uh the, the dark dark wheel what was it the dark wheel or the, the dark, dark wheel the, the, yeah. the no novella that came with it yeah. uh, put even more ideas in your mind about what was ultimately yeah. a very empty game of yeah. space trading but yeah. this all helped towards it. For me, the, the biggest catalyst for this whole feeling was a physical map on the wall because when you're not playing the game, you look at it and you think, oh, I've not been to that part of the world, I've not been to that island. I wonder what's on it. How do I get there? And then you start to think, well, I, I need a boat. How do I fund a boat? What dungeons do I need to go to? What, uh, what, what trades do I need to partake in to create something and sell it and raise the funds? You know, What's the quickest way of getting this boat? How do I get there? And then... Before you know it, you're creating a quest in your head that is completely separate from any other objective in the game, completely needless within the game's um, you know, mission context. You're just exploring, and you're just using the resources that are in the world to enable that exploring. Um, that, for me, is total immersion. I'm thinking about it when I'm not in it. I'm planning what I'm going to do when I'm next in it. Um, I can't remember the last game that made me feel like that, but there have been plenty along the way, starting with you. Yeah, you. You for, let's not see it. Um, Ultimate Doom. No, also yeah. um, Midwinter, Hunter. Oh, yeah. Hunter on a much smaller scale. Um, mercenary. Mercenary, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was the whole thing. I mean, yeah. So uh, Elder Scrolls, going back to Elder Scrolls, the Elder Scrolls, the Bethesda has created games where you can – you can just ignore everything else and do what you want to. You can go places. You can find things you've not seen. You can speak to characters you've not spoken to before. Absolutely amazing to get lost in these worlds. So happy 30-year anniversary to the Elder Scrolls, which is now not elderly. Time now for our community question of the week. Dave, have you taken the answers out of contest mode? Please, drumroll. Oh, but I'm going to do it right now. Duncan's Boom! It's done. And a hi hat. Oh no, a symbol. Thank you. One more. There we go. <laughs> Our question of the week last week was what is your go to most comforting bit of retro and why? It could be a game, an application, piece of hardware that allows you to switch off and just be happy. Uh, so now contest mode is off. I can read the top answer, which comes from Computerist 1969. My Vic20. I fire that up and I'm 11 years old again, except this 11-year-old had rich parents who could afford a disk drive and a monitor. This is what we were talking about earlier, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Exactly yeah. that. Yeah. You can't be 11 again, but you can try and you can do it in the context of being richy rich and having absolutely every peripheral, uh, every upgrade possible slammed into that machine. It still won't make you 11 again. <laughs> The disk drives back then cost sometimes more than the computer itself. Oh, madness, madness. And then the disks themselves, yeah. Yeah. Weeping Scorpion 1982 says the music, Mod, Sid, and oh, Midi yes. through yes. FM or Wavetable for mod, for mod titles, Pinball Dreams, and Fantasy Intro and Menu Music. The music from the Dope Demo uh, bought an Orpheus 2 partly to run on that one and some of Jester's work for Sid... I could go with many, but Rob Hubbard's sib cover of Jean-Michel Jarre's Zulu uh, led me down the 
orally pleasing rabbit hole. I think he's made this deliberately difficult to read for me. Um, which is Jean Michel Jar, and unbeknownst to me at the time, so did Martin Galway's cover of Magnetic Songs Fields Four, used in Yar Kung Fu. Lastly, for were these licensed? I wonder. Um, Captain Blood though was Jean Michel Jar. The music and that is amazing. Mm. Uh, on the on the uh, that was one of the, the the ST games that blew me away when I first got it. Um, sorry, that's not what Weeping Scorpion says. This is this is me taking over. Um, lastly, for MIDI, uh, there are too many, but Dark Call, so Episode One, Mission Three from Dooms, the first level of Descent One, the third level of Descent Three, Fatal Racing, and so many many more. What memory he's got. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily play the games or turn on the demos. I just play the music, and it instantly takes me back to the days of DOS and our Commodore 128. And now I will shut oh, up. Commodore 128. There you go. He did have well off That's parents. a beast. That's a beast <laughs> of a machine. Uh, gaming for me says has to be the Pentium 3, Windows 98, and Voodoo Experience. Anytime I want to be whisked back to the mid to late 90s, hearing the whir of the fans as the beast springs to life. All I have to do is hit the power button. Getting ready for some Unreal Tournament, Command and Conquer, Warcraft 2, Quake, or any number of games from that era in the late 90s was a true golden age for PC gaming, and one I always return to for some retro comfort food. My Pentium 3 system always sits at the ready. Great list of games. Warcraft 2 actually stuck around for years on my yeah. system, yeah, um, especially game. as a, uh, a link-up game over serial to play head-to-head. That was, that was really great. And Rope Tournament, Command & Conquer, Quake. Yeah, it's a great era. Uh, that's all three that's our that's our top three but there's a lot more answers besides yeah. we've got sonic the hedgehog on the game gear from rally um tetris on the game boy from jeff mendoza colonel mustard my comforting retro is this podcast diddle heart shape that's nice isn't it that's, that's how you that should about. be the top answer <laughs> Um, any pop out for you there, Dave? Any more? Yeah, Richard Cheers says if I was to mention blue and orange, I can feel people sighing apart from the wonderful pillock. <laughs> um, and he's talking about Workbench 1.3. And he says, now it's time to listen to the excellent twerk track by Paul H again, so I'll shut up. Yeah, that is my favorite color scheme as well the, uh, the, the orange and blue of 1.3. Oh, there's a good one Star Trek Next Generation. Now, that is, comf- there's something definitely comforting about Star Trek Next Generation. Well, Steve P. Edwards says Windows Notepad. That's where he goes for comfort. <laughs> I'm not quite on board as that. Uh, we've got Jet Strike on the CD32 from uh, Lord Borak. Um, God, so many. I think this might be the most answered question we've ever asked. I don't know, but um, have a look through the rest. There's a, a go to our subreddit. What's the address of our subreddit, Neil? It is reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro, where you can see the question of the week. You can see the latest show. You can see all the news stories people have submitted. Shout out to Dr. Local, because when I woke up this morning, I opened the subreddit and there was a picture of me as Pat Sharp with a huge mullet in the fun house. This was a, a 90s TV show for those who aren't from the UK. With I've the not twins. seen that. Um, <laughs> uh, there's breaking news. I am to reboot fun house. This week in retro reaches 5 million subs and <laughs> sightings of the ghost of Chris. Do you know, um, <laughs> do you know I didn't even notice it, it was your face on Pat Sharp's because when you look at Pat Sharp, Pat Sharp has a, a wonderful mullet, but not just a, a mullet. He's got the whole kind of MacGyver bit of the front coming up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 and, of course, the twins. I didn't notice that. <laughs> That's uh, I cannot confirm nor deny that I'm bringing back Funhouse. Uh, so thank you. Please head over to the subreddit to take part in the question of the week. Uh, please go to patreon.com forward slash this week in retro if you'd like to support the show. Please go to rmcretro.store if you'd like to buy a this week in retro mug or a whole list mug. of other uh, other merch. Mug and off face on. Um, and well, thank you so much for listening. Um, great to get another show in the can as they say dave we're done we're done i'm waving and now we wave we're waving thanks so much have a great week everyone take care bye-bye this week in retro was presented by neil from rnc the cave and dave 
It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.